Welcome to the AEC Disruptors podcast. Uh, this is Jackson Sinsat. Christopher is out this week, but we are pleased to be joined by Todd Wyant, filling in for Chris, the host of the Bridging the Gap podcast. I should say the award-winning Bridging the Gap podcast. And we are also pleased to be joined by Renee Morcos. He is the founder of Alice Technologies, and he is also an adjunct professor of construction management at Stanford University. How are you two doing? Doing great. Yeah, doing well. Excited to be uh, be crashing, co-hosting on, on this. Thanks for the, the invite. And Renee, excited to, to get the chance to, to talk with you even further. Yeah, likewise. Good to see you again, Todd. Yeah, you as well. Absolutely. Todd, we're going to have to do a home and home. You know, That's right. that, that way we can return the favor. Um, I like it. So, Renee, coming from the construction side, um, you know, I, I've got to admit, when I f- first heard of the concept of Alice, I was a little bit spe- skeptical. But after doing some research and, you know, reading into your background and everything like that, I'm 100% a full believer now. Um, but I want to start at the beginning. Um, I read an article about your background and your journey to where you're at right now is very unique compared to many of the guests that we've had on this podcast. Um, And I think we could honestly do an entire podcast just on your journey up to this point. Um, But could you go a little bit into your background? Um, What got you started in construction? Um, you know, the different places that you've built and uh, what your inspiration was behind Alice? Yeah, uh, happy to do that. Uh, you're correct. It's definitely not the, the typical, uh, typical kind of journey. Um, my, my family, uh, my, my dad's Lebanese, mom's Czech, uh, was born in Prague, Czech Republic. Uh, my family escaped communism. So that was kind of the, the first uh, experience that we had with, with the large kind of systems that, that we didn't agree with. Um, then we were in Beirut for, for five years. Uh, unfortunately, the war broke out. So uh, really kind of got to experience that for, for five years of my life. Um, I think truthfully, the, the reason that's significant is I kind of got to, you know, feel or, or start, start to understand what destruction looks like. And so the antidote to that is obviously construction, right? Uh, and so when I graduated university, uh, I liked building stuff, right? I, I never liked the schooling, which is funny because I'm a professor now, but uh, I, I would cut class and I would go uh, knock and like, I would find the coolest project in town, knock on their door and be like, hey, do you need a, you know, an extra hand? And they'd be like, you know, you look like you're 19, like buzz off. And I'd be like, what if I work for free? And they'd be like, oh, okay. Uh, and then usually at the end of the month, I'd ask them for a little beer, beer money, right? But um, and the cool thing was that I got to hand select like the cooler jobs in town, like an underwater sewer pipeline or building university, you know? And so um, first job I took, I kind of went back to a war zone, right? So I went to Afghanistan uh, to re- help rebuild the country. And, you know, it, it's sometimes like I'm, I'm uh, like, I wish that we were back in the, the, like the golden era of, of construction of civil engineering, right? So around like the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, right? Where like civil engineers were really pushing back, you know, or helping grow civilization, right? Uh, and so to me, uh, being in Afghanistan, I got to see really like firsthand, like, you know, I built the first Windows Doors factory, right? For a country that at the time had 17 million people, right? Uh, every little thing you do, um, impacts the, the world around you. And very few things have the ability to impact the world like civil engineering, right? Civil so AEC in our, our field. Uh, if you look at, for example, one of the statistics I kind of like to remember is there's a graph of, of cholera outbreaks. And I think the city was Chicago, right? And you kind of like saw these cholera outbreaks, which were in the tens of thousands, right? And then the sewer system gets installed and like, boom, like it just drops, right? And so... Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I ended up you know, doing what I'm doing. My, my dad was a civil engineer, right? You know, he, he told me, son, study anything you want. Just don't do civil engineering. I was like, brilliant. I, I know what I'm going to dedicate my life to. Thank you. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I got to see him build stuff. Like, I think one of the things I liked about watching his job, you know, and, and I remember my mom saying this, right? Which she said, you know, you, your dad gets to really experience this, this like joy of like pointing at something that he did. That's true. Like we'd be driving around you'd be like, oh, you see that little villa? Like I built that, you know? And to me, going home, like that's, our field is, is incredibly stressful, incredibly complicated, right? Uh, there are lots of crap goes wrong, right? You know, machines break down, delays, design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But like, you know, going home with like little flicks of concrete in your hair and knowing that like, I put a column there, it did not exist this morning and now it does. And that column is going to be there after I'm not, right? That just kind of, yeah, gets me excited. So that's kind of, you know, I guess how I got to what I do, what, I, what I'm doing today. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you saying, you know, how your father, you know, you would go buy a building and he'd say, I built that. And I didn't grow up in a construction family. Most of my family are educators, um, but I really wanted to be able to see my work and be able to point at it, you know, to, you know, my kids in the future to, you know, family members like, Hey, I did that. And, you know, there, there's a sense of pride that comes from that. And I can tell, you know, that, you know, you've got the pride and the things that you've done in the past. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask is, you know, here in the States, like you said, <laughs> there are so many different variables that go into a construction project. My last job was in downtown Austin and it was right across the street from the Austin convention center and, you know, South by Southwest happens every year in Austin mm -hmm. for two weeks. We could not get deliveries in because of South by Southwest. And we had to make a contingency plan for that. Luckily it had a three story underground parking garage and we were able to store material down there. But, you know, you never know what's really gonna happen in construction, whether it's weather um, or, you know, just there are so many things that are outside of your hands. Um, when you were in Afghanistan and you were building there, um, you know, that was probably multiplied by a factor. Um, you know, I read that you had like, you know, um, bodyguards and whatnot around you. And one of the things I read was that it really, uh, when you're there, you know, there's a lot more pressure to get the job done on time. That way you can, you know, get out of there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what was, what was that like in particular? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll put it this way. The official slogan of the company was Haro construction of Afghanistan. Take it easy. We'll build it again. So, you know, uh, lots of, lots of repeat customers. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it was just pretty, uh, pretty crazy, you know, on, on the one hand, like you got to play the role of the master builder. You were the architect, the engineer, the structural engineer, mechanical, electrical plumbing, um, you basically uh, uh, got to, you know, do all the procurement, all the construction management. Uh, and yes, lots of stuff would go wrong, right? I mean, you, the name of the game was kind of, you know, you've got to outthink your way out of everything, right? You, you were repairing an RP, you know, RP, like the way the work showed up was, was haphazard in the sense that, you know, somebody fires an RPG at the airport blows a hole in the, in the, in the runway. Right. And you're like, okay, well, you got to go fix it. And, uh, when you dig up a runway, you know, they, they had this temporary, um, temporary kind of cover on it for a little bit. And, and when you dig that up, you know, um, in a country that's landlocked, there's a lot of, you've just taken away 30% of the airport's capacity. And so you can kind of imagine that that gets a lot of people kind of very interested in what you're doing, right? And so we had this, this colonel at the time, his name was Colonel Ondul. And that guy was, I mean, it was like something out of the movies. You know, uh, he had a riding crop that we would hold. He would walk around in a, in a, in a goose, goose step fashion. And uh, he was a very, 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 very intimidating man. <laughs> and not in a bad way. I mean, he, you know, I'm sure he was very polite, but... He just commanded 1,700 people, you know, fully armed men in a war zone. And so he wanted his darn taxi, you know, his darn 
X-ray runway fixed, right? And wanted it done like today. And so, yeah, uh, the issue with that, for example, was, was it needed these specific dowels. It, you couldn't put rebar because the, the concrete had to kind of breathe because of the, the damage that it was, you know, caused. And so you had to figure out how do you get a smooth piece of steel when all you had was, was you know, ridged pieces of steel, right? And so, you know, we ended up having to, you know, run this by, you know, their central command in Germany. We had a specific kind of um, you know, design proposal of how we're going to get around it, right? But, um, you know, all kinds of stuff happens, right? You know, somebody shows up in your construction project with a machine gun, right? And decides that you need to stop working, right? Um, you find, like, I remember being in a meeting and this dude walks in with a rusted grenade that he found outside, you know? I mean, that definitely gets your attention. <laughs> like, mate, like, is there no way you could have left that outside like, before? Like, seriously, you know? Like, no, I, I really don't need to see it. <laughs> like, uh, so yeah, you know, you you know, dig, digging, right? I mean, you know, here in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the real world, the normal world, right? You, you, you're you worried about hitting a, a, a pipe of some sort, right? Over there, you're worried about hitting a landmine, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, lots of, lots of stuff goes wrong and you're really pushed very, very hard to think up solutions. Like you forget a screw, literally like a bag of screws and it will take you three months to reorder it because there is no market, right? And so you get really, really, really good at planning, which is kind of funny because I ended up you know, building a planning company, but you get really good at, at, at figuring out like, you know, which crews do you order? Like you forget something, you know, the other option you have is you got to, you know, talk to the airline pilots, which you're all friends with to bring it in the personal luggage. And so you can kind of imagine that kind of limits what it is that you can kind of, you know, bring into the country, right? And so, so that's, that was kind of you know, the, the, the challenges of it. Um, but on the, on the flip side, right? Like you have this incredible freedom to like go build, right? Like the stuff that you're doing is having like day-to-day -day impact. We built the first professional construction marketplace, right? In, in Kabul, right? Like you literally have real world impact every day, right? You I build the offices for this, you know, generating, you know, power generation company, right? Um, you know, military base, right? I mean, that, that changes things substantially, right? So, um, yeah, a very challenging environment, rapidly changing, right? Lots of stuff thrown at you every day. Like, you know, I mean, literally you wake up at, you know, 5.30 a.m. and you're just 20 minutes in, you're, you're on the call, right? This happened, that happened, this changed. Uh, you know, the, the quality, you know, supply chain issues, right? You know, supply chain isn't, isn't great, the quality issues and so on and so forth. So, yeah, but it, it, it's extremely rewarding and it definitely teaches you to, to think on your feet, you know? Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, so I, I really like the, the line that you used earlier on seeing all the destruction mm -hmm. in, in your past made you want to go the opposite way in construction. Uh, how do you think those experiences really kind of shaped your view on the potential of technology for this industry then? That's a great question. I mean, you know, it's, it's definitely it, right? I mean, it, 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 there's definitely something to being in a war zone where you're the antidote to what you see around you, right? Yeah. It, it's really clear to you that like, no, I'm not part of this whole thing that, that I'm watching. I'm part of building a solution, building stuff, you know, around me, right? Um, in terms of, you know, how, how technology helps, like technology in itself helps us the, the thing that technology does in, 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 in my eyes is it enables what wasn't possible to be possible, right? Mm -hmm. And it usually does this by, you know, reducing the effort required to do it, right? That's what it usually does. And so, um, you know, I can generate lots of solutions. I can generate lots of options. I can, you know, find, you know crunch problems, you know, of, of bigger sizes, bigger complexities than I've been able to do, right? And so technology, you know, in my mind, enables us to do what we couldn't do before, and then enables us to, to build in, in better ways than we, we've been able to do before. Yeah, I, th I think that's really interesting. Because you had said the line earlier, too, of yeah, it kind of required you to, you had to outthink your way out of something, something to that effect. Yeah. Um, so technology then really comes in and, and really helps enhance you 
your ability to outthink yourself because obviously the the human mind can only think of a you know a certain finite number of options but technology is a such a big force multiplier that you can think of any option possible really through uh you know if, when you are able to harness and leverage the right technology yeah well it's it's kind of what we're saying it's it's not so much ai as ia right it's not so much artificial intelligence as intelligence augmentation right and you'll, mm -hmm. you'll see that over and over again right what the machines enable you to do is kind of it's a multiplier of your of your inherent knowledge or ability or skill set right and if that knowledge is zero then the technology is, is really going to multiply that zero for you right so um one of the other things that i read is you know on one of your first jobs um and i believe this was you know after you had already left afghanistan um you notice a lot of inefficiency going on um whether that be where materials are placed or you know just you know people seeming to have a lot of downtime i know a lot of people like to <laughs> say that about um road construction <laughs> every time i see the workers are just hanging out um but you actually placed a camera on the job site and to kind of try to help measure, you know, how efficient things were going. And um, I believe the number was real work was only occurring about 3% of the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could, yeah you, could you speak a little on that? Yeah, so it, it, uh, we were building the, the cruise ship terminal uh, in Amsterdam. Right. And so I'm in this, this meeting and the darn thing is six weeks late, right? 50,000 euros a day, right? It was a $50 million job. So you can imagine like the, the mood in the room, right? You know, Dutch folks are generally very sort of reserved and quiet, but there, there's, there's some yelling going on. And so, you know, as this, this is happening, I'm like, well, now I just, I don't want to be sit at, sit, 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 seated at the table at the time, right? Because the, 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 the mood in the room is really kind of off the charts. So I sort of get up and I walk over to the window and I look out of the window and this, this guy's like, look, I can't work any faster. I can't work any faster. I'm doing what I can. And I look outside and I notice a hundred thousand square foot of space, six people standing in. So I'm like, wait, holy cow. Like it's empty. And I realized like every other construction project I've ever seen, right. Has been empty. Right. So it's like, you know, when I looked at my projects in, in, in Kabul, when I look like, I remember, you know, my boss coming to, to kind of, you know, take a look at what we're doing. I was like, oh, wait, um, there's a, uh, like, it doesn't look like we're doing much, even though I've got 60 people out there, right? But if you wander around, there's just lots of empty space. And so, you know, take a look at any construction project, drive down the road and literally pick one, right? If you take a look at a construction project, what you'll notice is there's a lot of empty space, right? There's a couple of pockets of work, but lots of empty space. And so we're like, okay, well, let's measure that. And so what we did was we basically took photos every 22 minutes of projects, right? And uh, what we measured was bays, you know, the space between four columns. And so we, you know, all we did was we said, hey, is there work occurring or not? And the truth of the matter is, is that the number was so low that we, we, we just started measuring if there's anybody there, right? Forget if they're working or not. Right, because it was 3%. So we, we, you know, I ran the experiment in, in Amsterdam, right? And I was like, well, so then we ran it twice here in the US on, you know, very you know, high profile jobs, right? Like jobs were you know, top names in construction, you know, GCs that are, you know, household names were working. And each th three times, right? And, and the number was 2.7, 2.9 and whatever, three or something, right? It was literally 3%. And so that was sort of like, wait, I mean, 3% of space is used for construction. That seems to point that there's a lot of room to increase that, right? So if you increase space usage, you're, you're doing more things at the same time. If you're doing more things at the same time, you're building faster. So it was like, ah, so that's kind of how the whole journey started theoretically, which was, you know, started to realize that if you want to increase space usage, you probably need something that can allocate resources and sequencing, right? And when we did that, we basically set it up and, and the, um, you know, the, uh, you could start generating lots of sequences, right? 
And when, when, you know, I remember showing this to, you know, my PhD advisor at the time, and he sort of looks at it and says, look, this is great, but you got to validate it with the, the project manager. You got to validate it with the, with the person that actually built this. You know, and that's the, I got to handle it. That's the thing about Stanford. It's always like extremely industry focused. And so I remember saying like, yeah, but this guy's in Amsterdam and the response was, I don't care if he's on the moon, get it validated. So I was like, okay. So, you know, gave those guys a free week of consulting. They gave me a plane ticket, went to Amsterdam, showed it to him. And that's when it hit me. I was like, oh, wow. This thing knows how to build. It doesn't know how to build very well, but it can build. So I was like, what the heck? So I'm back on the plane across the, the pond, so to speak, you know, sipping on a, on a Heineken, you know, and then get back to, to school. And I was like, kind of like, okay, well, why, how come? So I started digging in there and I was like, oh, like, this is why it's doing all the things that it's doing, right? And that was kind of the start of the, the whole journey. Interesting. So was that a 3%? That's a, first off, it's just shockingly little. Yeah, right. Number. Uh it stemmed from kind of a, a lack of optimization on how to lay things out and kind of the, the flow of the work or what were some of the oh, yeah, kind of pillars of that? Cool. So there's a, there's a couple of things that you, you want to think about, right? So the asset utilization in other fields, say manufacturing, you know, yeah, badly run factory, maybe 60, a really well run factory, maybe 80. You know, I mean, you can get asset utilization, you know, truthfully, kind of highest you'll see in the in, in real, real world somewhere around 80%. Uh -huh. And so you're like, okay, well, well, 80 versus even 60 versus three, right? <clears throat> so what's right. going on? So I started, you know, futzing around with this. And, and so it turns out that you could increase space usage, right? You could just like throw a lot of people at something. But the, the problem when you increase space usage is that you start introducing spatial clashes. You start, you know, having safety issues. People are on top of each other. There's not enough, not enough room to do the work, right? You schedule two things to occur in the same space at the same time. And so you're like, ah, well, I want to increase space usage while guaranteeing that people aren't crashing into each other. That was the, right. that was the kind of theoretical uh, problem statement, right? That's what I'm going to go solve. And so the issue we have, and this is kind of mind boggling, is that None of our tools, none, right? And there's an exception I'll talk about, or should I say that, almost none, model space. Not just that, the, the, the tools that we use to manage construction don't model uh, the product that you're building. If you look at an estimate or you look at a schedule, they don't tend to have the design like that's connected to it, right? So you're not modeling the, the space that you're needing to go build something. And so if you're not modeling it, how on earth are you going to manage it? Mm -hmm. Right. There's line of balance scheduling, right? Which I, you know, when I was starting my PhD, I did a lot of research on that, right? Before we developed Alice, I was like, hey, this is a great way to schedule things, right? But the, the line of balance scheduling also has, you know, really, really, really big limitations. Apologies, I'm going to turn this off. So line of balance scheduling also has really big limitations, right? In the sense that you can't figure out exactly what spaces are being used. There's, there's zones, right? And so you can't figure out if there's two things occurring in the zone, is that a problem or not, right? And so, you know, basically, right, when we started running these algorithms, what we started to realize was the theoretical limit, right, of space usage was somewhere around 60, 65%. We well, you know, going from three to 65. It's a big a, jump. It's a huge jump, right? And so the, 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 the reason I think that that's kind of significant is, is not so much like, oh, do you as a human want to go and build it at the theoretical fastest com you know, possible completion time, right? Like, man, probably not. But suddenly, like, what kind of blew me away was like, wait, you, you, you have control. Like, you can pick. You can pick any number from three to 60. So it's like, whoa, that, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's, that's generally what you'll see with the software, right? In the sense that um, you, you like, the machine is just a number crunching, you know, entity. You, the human, are the one that has the ability to decide whether you want it to be 3, 15, 50, or 60, right? And it, it's really a question of risk, 
right? Like how, how, how close to the edge do you want to be? If we ran 600 million simulations for you and said the fastest possible completion time is 94 days, would you want to go tell your owner that? No, don't do that. Because if, if the fastest of 600 million simulations is 94 days, you know, anything happens, you're going to be late. Right. Right. So that's kind of what, what, what we're seeing on the tool, right? That back to the, the sort of the, 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 the space, right? Is that you, the theoretical limit somewhere around 60, 65, right? But more important than that, it's not like, oh, are we going to go build it at 65, right? Because it turns out that space usage and duration of construction are they're, they're mathematical relationship. The more things you do concurrently, the faster you complete. Pretty simple. Kind of mm -hmm. makes sense, right? And so then if the fastest theoretical is 65, where do you want to be? So to me, the really big deal was that you can now very effortlessly move along that slider you could you could pick whatever number you wanted yeah i <laughs> i think it's funny because you don't want to tell the owner about the 65 percent or uh the contractor um we used to always operate by the saying under promise and over deliver yeah. <laughs> so i think that's a good example of that um but as you know you know in the construction market in general, it's really behind when it comes to technology. There's this culture of this is the way we've always done it. This is how we're going to continue to do it. You know, we've been building buildings for hundreds of years. Um, but it, there's almost a culture of, you know, not embracing innovation. And I see you and you are going in the complete opposite direction, you know, using AI to help, um, you know, schedule and cost jobs in the most efficient manner possible because humans themselves like todd said there's no way for a human to possibly determine all of the different variables within a construction project so with the ai um you know how does that like there's an emergence in prefabrication in construction. And I come from the MEP space and we did a lot of prefabrication. Um, so we would be basically building part of the job at our shop while the job was going on. So how does Alice take into account things like prefabrication and offsite construction? So it turns out that, uh, the prefabrication folk tend to have a higher use of it for it than, than, than regular construction folk, which kind of surprised me, right? And, and here's why. The, the truth about prefabrication, a lot of people don't realize kind of two fundamental things, which is if you're prefabricating it, you are still fabricating it. Like it, it didn't, you know, the production piece of the puzzle didn't sort of magically disappear, right? You are making it, you're just not making it in the location where it's gonna, you know, in the final location, you're just making it offsite. That has a lot of benefits, right? You've got a, a you know, controlled environment, you know, you're not uh, you know, welding something upside down or, or whatever the, the situation might be. The other is that you still need to transport it to where it's gonna be installed, right? And so to answer your question, factories also have capacity limits, right? And so if you have a factory that's, that's, that's prefabricating -fabri things for you, um, one of the questions that, that would arise with some of the companies we worked with that were doing large scale prefabrication, like lots of projects, would be, well, where do you send the columns that you just prefab, right? Alternatively, a different way to think about it is like, you have a certain capacity to produce X number of ducts or X number of slabs or X number of panels or whatever the, the, the thing that you're prefabbing is, where do you send that capacity? Because ultimately you, you'll, what you'll start to see is that you will, the, there is usually some blend of prefabricated and you know, uh, cast, you know, uh, in situ construction, right? And so with, the, with something like Alice, what you can very quickly see is, hey, if I send it to location A, it will have a bigger impact you know, in duration than if I send it to location B in a good way or a bad way or whatever that, that sort of is. Another thing that you'll see is that if there's an issue in the factory, right, or if there's an issue with delivery, 
right, or weather or whatever the the the, the the mitigating, you know, the, the 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 delaying factor is, the way to mitigate it becomes a lot easier with something like what we've developed, right? Because it's a simulator, you can just rebuild your projects, you know, many many different ways, right? The the multi-project, you know, optimization, which is how do you shift capacity around from project to project, becomes kind of the key question, and that's a a really big, you know, question to, to answer, right? If you're, if you're building five jobs, right? You have a prefabrication factory and you're building five jobs, where do you send those prefab components and when, right? Yeah, I think that makes total sense that, that prefab has a, a higher use and really the, the need to optimize everything from you know the, the timeline to the logistics to production even is, is even more critical when you are prefabbing to, to have that workflow mm -hmm. totally kind of optimized. Uh, I, I want to circle back on Jackson's kind of setup to his, his last question on the innovation side of things. Renee, I, I think that you do an incredible job of, of really speaking to innovation and having that, that mindset. When you were on Bridging the Gap, you, you had mentioned the book, How to Fly a Horse. Uh, mm -hmm. I read it after that episode and loved it. Thanks for the recommendation. But uh, right. how do you encourage that that innovation and that willingness to try mindset in your students and your clients so let's let's address the root kind of the root not of cause but the root belief right which is construction is not innovative right um mm -hmm. i just think that's bullshit right i'm sorry right and, and and here's why the reason that we have an adopted technology is not because we are you know lazy and, and unsophisticated like other folks think Right. The reason is simply put because the technology hasn't been there. Right. It, it just has not. Right. Um, the reason it has not been there, right, is because construction, um, we tend to work on bigger, more complex problems than anybody else. Right. When you are building a you know, $350 million gas refinery like I built, right, and you're burning through $1.6 million a day. Like, trust me, the, the, the size and the complexity of that is unmatched truly by, you know, almost anything in the world, right? You got two, I remember it was 2 million documents that would go through that construction project over the course of a lifetime, mm -hmm. right? And those 2 million documents need to be allocated for, stored, versioned, controlled, et cetera, right? You screw up one of those documents and you built the wrong thing, right? So... The truth is that it's been really easy to digitize other fields, or sorry, I should say it's been easier to digitize other stuff. And if you look at how the digitization kind of has worked, and one of the first things was finance, right? And I like to use that as an example because it, it should be relatively easy to see that digitizing a bunch of numbers that sit in an account and then appear in another account, you know, it's a subtraction, like that's relatively easy to digitize, right? Digitizing a construction project, you're like, oh, well, the first thing we need to do is digitize design right and that didn't really happen till till 2015 right and so to to kind of you know answer your question the first thing i would do is really examine a little bit this belief that construction is not innovative research done um at stanford by a phd student that was kind of before me was showed that construction is actually really fast at adopting innovation when it's within one um vertical if it's a innovation for structural, if it's an innovation for mechanical, if it's an innovation to you know uh, polish concrete faster, like that stuff, you know, tools get adopted quickly, right? It's been the 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 horizontal across discipline stuff that has taken us longer, and you know, my sort of hypothesis or what I believe is is that's simply put because the technology didn't exist, and so if you read that How to Fly a, a, a Horse book, which is really one of my my favorite books. It explains that it goes through several sort of examples and it really explains that innovation is not what people think. It's not this like, oh, I had this like one idea and like, that's it, right? What, what you know, like Edison said, innovation is 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. And so to answer the question of how to encourage it, I think the way you encourage it is, is really by first explaining that, hey, this is not some... Innovation is not something that's like only really smart or really educated or really sophisticated or well capitalized people do. Like that is absolutely wrong. Read the book. It really kind of shows it, 
right? Mm -hmm. Innovation is something that, and I think I'm paraphrasing Jeff Bezos. He's like, well, to innovate, you kind of need, he said three things. I remember kind of two of them, which was you need the ability to, you know, withstand adversity, right? To, 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 to hear a lot of no's, to, to go through a lot of failures. You need the ability to kind of push back a lot against a lot of people that are going to be telling you that you're an idiot. Mm. Like, and, and that's true. And the, the, the thing about it is that by definition, right, it's going to be something that's not the most pleasant journey. And by definition, there's going to be rewards when you get it right. And when you think about it that way, our field has quite enough innovators, right? There are always people, right, who are earlier in their career want to make the name for themselves. Companies that are number three in the market but want to make it to number two, right? Companies that basically, you know, see the revenue and they want to double it, right? There are always people out there that want to do that. That's what defines humans, right? We are really, really good at standing up to adversity. And so that's a question like, I think to get people to innovate, I think the most important thing is to explain to them that you, everybody can do it. And it is something that takes a long time and a lot of failure, right? But if you are like, to me at this stage of my career, if I'm not failing, like on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, and I have, you know, moments of like, two weeks, three weeks. And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm kind of taking things a little easy, right? Things aren't failing. But once I start like doing things, once I start pushing things, that's where I'm like, okay, well, this didn't work. That didn't work. This, you know, so like, you, and you keep, that's kind of what the book explains, right? You, you try like three, four things and these three didn't work. Oh, that one worked. Okay, cool. Let's, let's go with that. And then you solve that problem and it unlocks the next set of problems and so on and so forth. Right. And that's, that's really what innovation is like. And it, whether you're building an AI software or, rethinking your company's ERP system, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. One of the big things that I, I really liked about the book was the examples of all the, you know, the big innovations of Edison or the, the Wright brothers or something that you look back on and you go, oh, it's this really big transformational thing that happened at one time. But yeah. then he goes through and it's all these small, tiny little incremental changes and then learnings from other people that they took in and tweaked 100%. and adopted that it's you know you're standing he has some line that you're not standing on giants because who are the giants standing on then you're standing just on people after people after people uh, yeah. trying to make it better so yeah i that was really good good stuff yeah it's exactly it i mean when i read that book i was like oh wow like this is this is my life right because because you know people look at, at alice as the final product and they go whoa it's the world's first generative construction simulator you guys have built the world's first visual constraint programmer that encodes complex construction constraints you guys have a solution that generates 600 million options in 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 three hours you have you know the first system that automatically produces 4d models that automatically produces gantt charts that optimizes for you know a whole bunch of you know objectives cost time duration workflow it's like wow that's incredible but then like truthfully you know, there's been in the history of company, like there are two, three things where, okay, we needed some really smart people to go crack this piece of the puzzle, but all in all, right. Um, it's just thousands upon, you know, thousands, like, I mean, truthfully, there's probably at this point, 10,000 little things that we figured out. And when I say like little things, like, like it literally, it, it requires like zero intelligence. It's like, we tried it this way, this way, this way. And oh, the fourth way worked. Okay, we and oh now well now we we solve that and unlock these things. So we try we solve we try this. Oh, these two things work. Well, let's pick this one. Okay, and then and that literally is like every day. That's that's how 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 it works. That's, that's what we're doing. Yeah, it's more patience than a, a single moment of creativity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's patience and 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 you you've got to kind of be okay with not being in this in the limelight in the spotlight, so to speak. Right, you've got to be okay like. People use the word innovation really very, uh, I'd say flippantly. Like to, to someone like me, I'm like, oh, you know, innovation. It's like this kind of new shiny object, right? But like, even if you go out and buy the new shiny object, which is a, the latest software or the latest whatever it is, like you buy the latest software, it still needs time to be integrated into your system. Right. Right. And that's where the innovation starts to come in, right? It, it, it takes time, right? And like, you know, that's, that's humans, right? Like if it, somebody somewhere is going to put the time into it, right? And so what we define as good is going to be something that took us effort, right? 
You know, there's, there's, there's very few easy or quick wins, right? It's not impossible, but, you know, if you look at certain companies that were built in, I don't know, four, five, six years, which is really, you know, four years incredibly fast, like, yeah, those folks got lucky, but still, there's a lot of iteration and innovation, right? The technology, the pricing model, the services, the, the go-to-market engine, the marketing, the messaging, like you're always tweaking little pieces of the puzzle, right? And so, yeah, it, it's exactly what you said. It's, it's perseverance. You're just sticking to it. It's, you know, Edison famously, you know, the, the story is really cool, right? He went to the world and said, I'm going to give you light. I'm going to figure out this thing that's going to create light. And I was like, you're nuts, right? I mean, we've been trying to figure this out for, for millennia. And so he sat in his lab and he had this, he had this idea of, well, I'm going to put a current through something. And that current's going to make it glow. And his original thinking was he, would, he, was, he was trying to find the material that would withstand that. So he tried you know, thousands of materials, like everything he could, he could think of or lay his hands on. And every time he did it, the darn thing burned, right? So, but, but he kind of, you know, that, that he's like, look, there's got to be a way to put a current through something that won't burn it. Yeah. And he, he gave the, he said, in one year, I will show you, I'll, I'll show the world how to do it. And he shows up and all these reporters are there and he goes, look, I, I don't have it. And everybody's like, ha ha, you're an idiot. You suck, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Which is, you hear that a lot when you innovate. And then, you know, he went back to the drawing board. And at some point he realized, hey, it's not the material. I just got to take the oxygen out. So that's what gave you the light bulb, right? But he, at the time, he said, I didn't fail. Everyone's like, oh, you failed. And he said, I didn't fail a thousand times. I just found a thousand ways it won't work. Right. But, you know, if you've read the book, it's, it's, you see that pattern over and over and over again, right? It's the same with Alice or, or anything else for that matter, right? And, and it's remarkable when you look at, like, the reason that that book is fascinating is you, you read it and you look at these incredible household names, right? You're like, okay, well, that guy must have been an absolute genius, right? And then you realize, like, no, he's doing it the same way I was <laughs> Just do like it. the rest of us. <laughs> just like the rest of us, you know? He's just, and Einstein said we wouldn't call it, if we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, yeah, like most inventions in the world, Einstein might be a bit of the exception there, but like most, that's what the book runs you through. Like most inventions in the world, you're like, that's, there's one way to do it. It turns out as human beings, we really, really, really suck at, at thinking about things that haven't been thought of before. And so we, we, like, that's the thing that I've learned. There's a huge difference between doing known and unknown stuff. With known stuff, we can make these huge leaps. Right? We're like, oh, I, I know how long it's going to take. I know exactly what I need to do. I know how to think about it. I know how to you know, crunch it. But the unknown stuff, you kind of take these little, little hops into the unknown. And you're like, oh, that one worked. And there's, there's kind of no other way to do it. Renee, I really appreciate your pushback on my you know, statement about innovation and construction. Because as you were going through your explanation, it made me think. And it made me think of my past experiences in the industry, you know, every construction project is different. You know, it's a unique, unique undertaking. No two construction projects are going to be the same. Even if you're building, you know, a big box store, there's going to be differences in the first one you built compared to the second one you built. There's going to be different challenges. Um, and, you know, with that, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm having a blank. So um, in terms of, you know, innovation and construction, um, you know, you mentioned how the technology hasn't been there. And another challenge that we face within construction is, you know, the labor shortage, both with skilled labor, as well as, you know, people and management. So we need to be leaner. Um, and we also need to be able to attract the new generation. I, I consider a lot in the new generation to be visual learners, you know, I personally played a lot of video games and I'm sure a lot of people still do. Um, and when I see your product, um, it's very visual. It's very easy on the eye. And it's cool because you can see um, how the project is, is going to go together in the most efficient way. Um, so with that and, you know, where you've taken the product, wh what do you think is going to be the next big thing? in construction, what do you think the new frontier might be? 
question. The next frontier. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you where, where I think it is in, from a research perspective. So I think that the, the bleeding edge of construction today is semantics. Right? And, and here's what I mean by that. A lot of the, the construction industry is getting digitized. So come, like we, for example, digitize the process itself, the simulation, the optimization, like how does it get built? Or we have a system that builds it for you, you know, 10,000 different times, right? You know, another question, right? Or, or other part, other people are, are digitizing you know, procurement, supply chain, timesheets, you know, so on and so forth, right? I think a lot of people don't realize that, that as, as much as we digitize construction, there's still the real world. The, the bricks still go on top of each other. And so those two worlds, the digital world and the construction world need to communicate. And so how do they do that? Well, if you want to sort of, if you want the two to communicate, you need a way to translate between these two universes. So here's an example. You go out to a construction site and you take a point cloud, right? If you measure that point cloud, right, the you need to, you know, translate that point cloud back into progress, back into a BIM model, back to a schedule, back to an estimate. Like, like a point cloud by itself is not very useful, right? And so if you want to translate it back into these, back into the, the digital version, if that makes sense, because ultimately what we need to do is, is compare the digital to the actual, right? The, the, the digital, the analog, so to speak, if that's one, one way to kind of classify it. But... To do that, you need to kind of understand what it is that you're looking at. You need context for these, these data sets, right? And that context, I think, is, is really the, the bleeding edge of, of where the field's headed, right? You know, it's, um, it's really, I think, um, you know, di digitizing, um, like, I think that, you know, Five to ten years from now, we'll have a machine that can. Here's where I think it will head. Right, we'll have a machine that can look at a construction site, right, and understand what's going on, like a little camera that sits there and watches it and gets what's happening. It'll be like, oh, we had <clears throat> twelve people show up in the concrete crew, and what they were doing today is they were pouring concrete using a pump, and the production rate was X. And they, you know, poured it on this slab on the third floor. Like, it will figure that out for you, right? Today, you can get a video, but that's a video, right? A human's got to go in and, and tag it with the information that I just talked about. And so that semantic tagging or coding, I think, is going to be the next big deal, you know? And it's, it's you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hairy problem, right? It's definitely not uh, not simple, but... You know, we, we've solved harder things than that. So, and I know for a fact, there's companies out there that are going after it. Yeah, that's interesting. I think you articulate the, the potential in construction really well. Why do you think that now is really the time to, to be in construction? 2017, right? You know, 2017 was the, the construction uh, uh, re renaissance. I pronounce renaissance, some people say renaissance but uh, whichever way you pronounce it, right? Um, the renaissance, I, I think, in construction happened in, in 2017, right? What's happening in construction today, what's happening to construction today is what happened to manufacturing back in the 70s and 80s. Right. right. The, basically, you know, sometime in 2017, the, the VCs kind of woke up and there's this kind of like collaborative mass realization that like, wait a minute, the tech's caught up. That the problem that we faced thus far, and that's the thing, it's, it's not that we've been like lazy, it's just that the tech sucked. Like, you know, think of BIM, it's a great example. When, if you read the literature, right, people were talking about BIM back in like 85, right? And that's 45, 87, I can tell you that, you know, there's a conversation about it, right? Um, parametric design, right, was, was done, you know, I think PTC was founded in 1980. God, maybe 87, something like that, right? 83, 87, right? Uh, the, the underlying technology existed. Graphisoft was founded in the 80s, right? Or, sorry, Archicad. Archicad was founded in the 80s, right? 
the issue was that that it turns out that and that the buildings are bigger more complicated than machines right and so really interesting kind of story i, I call it the bim wars right so what was happening parametric design is the ability to change a parameter like the height of an airplane wing and everything updates the cross sections update the elevations update the 3d model updates right and so as you can think you know the the name of the game for parametric design is the ability to change a parameter and not change ripples through your system right the because the the buildings you know are so big they wouldn't fit in one file the computer couldn't crunch something that big and so the, the way around it was they followed what they call a federated database approach and they split the they split the file into multiple multiple folders and so they're suddenly you know um I think it was Bentley at the time said, "Hey, we we've got these huge files, right? We can up, we can." I remember when I started my PhD. The big deal was like, how big a file can it handle? And then everyone was like, "Oh, Revit, it can handle like twenty megabyte files, right?" Whereas you know, Bentley was like, "Hey, we can handle handle large hundred, you know, hundreds of megabytes of files." But because you have the the information in separate folders, it becomes a lot harder to propagate changes across those folders, right? And so, you know, what you'll notice is Revit kind of focused back then on, which makes sense, the, 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 the technology that runs smaller jobs tended to be used in commercial, the technology that runs larger jobs tended to be used in infrastructure. But what's happened, Moore's law, the number of transistors in the microchip doubles every 18 months, right? Held steady since I think the 70s, right? Um, the computers caught up. And that happened, you know, 2017, the computer, the, 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 the Processors become fast enough to do parametric design. They became fast enough to you know, cloud computing became a thing. Optimization, like there was kind of this enough piece of the puzzle were in place where there was a shift. And if you look at the funding, right? Um, I actually looked it up and I, I now have the numbers. It went from somewhere around like 60 to, to 98 billion, right? Not exactly doubling, but a pretty, pretty large jump. Mm -hmm. So a lot of money got poured into construction tech. And suddenly what you had is these startups, right? Which are effectively, you know, everybody's R&D departments. That's why we exist, right? So suddenly you had access to a thousand research and development departments around the world that were doing research for you. And they were not just doing research, they were raising millions of dollars to do that research and then selling you the output at like 50, 100 grand. Kind of, kind of crazy, right? So that's you know what what, what happened. That's why suddenly there's been a change, and and anybody in construction that that's kind of you know seeing this is is aware of the fact that this field is is changing very very rapidly. Right. Yeah. Nice. Renee, I know we could talk about this for many hours, but I think we're, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. I know I learned a lot, and Todd. Thank you for filling in for Christopher. <laughs> Anytime. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Really great to see you guys. Thanks for having me. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Renee. So I'll just click stop.